Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> Dear honored guests and colleagues, I'd like to thank you for your participation in our panel focused on women and entrepreneurship. My name is Barbara Langley, and I serve as the director of a new Global Women's Economic Empowerment Initiative at the Center for International Private Enterprise, or SIPE, as it's more formally known. SIPE's Center for Women's Economic Empowerment works at the intersection of democracy and business, working to democratize opportunity for women by fostering robust economic ecosystems for entrepreneurship. As my colleagues in the office describe it, we work with the fish in order to change the water, meaning we work with business leaders to define what a better environment is for business in their country and help them with critical skills, research, consultation, and international best practice necessary to advocate key stakeholders and build that environment for themselves. On behalf of our panelists, I'd like to thank the Wilson Center and Indus for this opportunity to explore successful examples of how women's entrepreneurship promotes broader economic growth. Through discussion, we would like to also brainstorm a bit on possible strategies to either scale up efforts or take advantage of opportunities that would not only expand the space for women in commerce, but also jumpstart inclusive economic activity. While Pakistan fell, fared poorly on the Global Gender Gap Report in 2017 of the World Economic Forum, there are also positive steps taken to address these issues. For example, the Trade Organizations Ordinance was reformed in 2006 to allow the establishment of women-only business chambers across the country. This gives a voice and a platform for female entrepreneurs. In fact, the Federation of Pakistan Chambers of Commerce and Industry released a Women's National Business Agenda in December 2017, prioritizing four policy areas, small and medium enterprise development for women-led businesses, promotion of women-led businesses and facilitation and market outreach, increased share of women businesses in regional trade, improving export competitiveness and annual exports, and enabling women led businesses to address their financial needs, facilitate gender-friendly financial literacy, and improve financial services. As a result of the Chamber's efforts, the State Bank of Pakistan expanded the scope of their credit guarantee scheme to 12 more cities so that more women could benefit. The Ministry of Commerce has adapted gender-focused areas on their uh, draft trade policy framework. And consultative work on developing a unified definition of women-owned small and medium enterprises has started. The Women's National Business Agenda directly tackles the legal barriers to women's participation in commerce. However, it also indirectly addresses other traditional and non-traditional barriers to women in the economy, such as building their confidence, capacity, and connections to lead and to be seen as leaders in their communities. Thinking about women's entrepreneurship in this holistic sense is important. And to help us look at this issue from different angles, the symposium organizers have put together a dynamic panel uh, for our discussion. Um, our panelists include uh, Ms. Rudaba Nasser. She's the Employment Specialist at the Gender Secretariat of the International Finance Corporation. She is an international development and gender expert focusing on the nonprofit, private, and public sectors with an emphasis on women's economic, economic participation. Her work expands experience in her native country of Pakistan to South Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the United States. We also have with us right now, Mr. Naeem Zamindar. I hope I've got the pronunciation Perfect. correct. <laughs> um, Mr. Zamindar is the former chair of Pakistan's Board of Investment. He has also served as a Pakistan country director of Acumen Fund and has served as the CEO of Watin Telecom Limited. We also hope and expect to be uh, joined shortly by Samara Abbasi, who is the manager of We Create in Pakistan. Um, this is the first women entrepreneurship center. She unfor unfortunately was delayed to, due to visa issues and a further flight delay, but we're hoping that she'll be able to join us by the end of the, the panel. We Create provides facilities and business development support to women in business, and she's a strong advocate for women's economic empowerment, particularly through entrepreneurship. In addition, through the power of YouTube, <laughs> we will also hear from Yasmin Haider, president of the Pakistan Women Entrepreneurs Network for Trade. 
She was invited to attend the symposium, but unfortunately was unable to attend. However, she's offered us a video message to highlight her work. Uh, Ms. Anlib Abbas to our stage to offer our spotlight address. Ms. Abbas, come on. Gentlemen, after the crossfire, this is the ceasefire. <laughs> I'm uh, very grateful to Wilson Center and Indus for uh, having this very timely and valuable conference as we're talking about pathways to change. And um, I'm extremely uh, thankful to my old friend, Michael Kugelman, whose uh, interest in this region, uh, his thought process, his affection for people in Pakistan and in other countries has developed a deep understanding of what we are. <coughs> Because like I always say, understanding is the basis of all relationships in life, be them personal, political, international. Without understanding, there is misunderstanding. And misunderstandings are the bane of all conflicts, as we were seeing in the earlier panels as well. So we over here uh, are talking about understanding each other. And I'm fascinated when Michael tries to understand cricket in Pakistan. And I must confess that his knowledge about cricket is much more than my knowledge about baseball. He talks about uh, Fakhar Zaman's cover drives, and I try to talk about Mike Trout's hit and run, and then I say, no, it's home runs. <laughs> and so, uh, so this dialogue that is going on in the last few years that I've been associated with Michael helps us know better because understanding may not lead to love, but love definitely leads to understanding. And his, the overall idea is to bring people together. So that's why I'm here today, very grateful to Michael, very grateful to Indus, and very grateful to Wilson Center. And like conferences are, context setting is more about uh, you know throwing statistics. That's the tradition. And I'm absolutely not going to break this tradition. <laughs> so I'm going to throw a few statistics in the beginning. But I assure you there'll be just few. We're talking about women entrepreneurship. And we're talking about women entrepreneurship in Pakistan. And uh, there are three numbers I want you to remember. 90. 70 and 2. So 90 is the number of small and medium enterprises in Pakistan. 90% of businesses are small and medium. And out of that 90%, the figure that I want you to remember is 70. So the non-farm employment, because Pakistan is basically an agri-based agri economy and 60% of people work in the agriculture sector. The non-farm employment, 70% of it is in small and medium enterprises. So 90 and 70, and those small, medium enterprises, 90% of them, only 2% are owned by women. And so you can look at either way. You can look at it as nothing can be done, or you can look at it as, what a great opportunity. And I think that's why we are here. Because I, being from this field, being an entrepreneur myself, and now in, in the political arena, I'm excited by this opportunity. And I've seen such talent in Pakistan. And I've seen such huge potential over there that I feel that if we are in, moving in the right direction, it should be just a matter of time before we unleash the not the giant, but the giantesses over there. So um, what I want to say is we're talking about entrepreneurship. And you know, normally, in all over the world, you say people who are selling door-to-door, -door, single people, or people who are maybe stitching in their houses, uh, they are also entrepreneurs. But they are 
what Rufos, the researcher, calls the forced uh, reluctant entrepreneurs. I'm talking about the designed and the intentional entrepreneurs or the rebellious entrepreneurs like me, because what happened to me was that, uh, you know, I belong to a family of uh, four sisters, no brother, and my father and my mother had made a whole track about who's going to do what. So the eldest one was going to be a doctor. I was supposed to do CSS exam and go into the government. The younger one was going to do her business, and the last one was going to become a lawyer. So I remember that um, right out of school, uh, just going to college, my father called me and he said that, you know, I want you to uh, do civil service and become a government servant. And I looked at him and I said, servant? I don't want to be anybody's servant. I mean, so I was 18 years old and I was, and a servant of the government? No way. And he kept on convincing me and I kept on telling him, I want to be my own boss. I want to have, have a boss. And that is how I started thinking of what I want to do with myself. And so we're talking about those designed entrepreneurship uh, choices where people employ other people. And it's not just a single enterprise of somebody doing something for just themselves. So coming into that category, I'm going to be talking about uh, entrepreneurship in Pakistan as three Ps. Pragmatism, why it should be there, prudence, and finally the purpose. So pragmatically, if you look at Pakistan, and some of the figures Barbara very rightly pointed out, 200 million people, 50 percent, 100 million women, 100 million women. And we need to create jobs. We need to create jobs ASAP. Because there's a youth bulge over there. 60 million of these women are young, under 30. And they have energy. And they have ideas. And we need to channelize them. Because we have seen what non-channelized energy can do to a country. So pragmatism means that we have to give them the opportunity to do what they want to do in a sphere and in a domain and in an en enabling environment. And the government can help, and I want my panel to think about it, because there are policies that can encourage. Some of them have been mentioned by Barbara. Uh, for example, literacy rates. We were in government. Pakistan Tariq and Saf was in government. And we, in five years, said, OK, every 100 schools that we are going to be having now, 70 are going to be for women, 30 for boys to increase the literacy rate. So what are the things that we can do to improve the women entrepreneurship uh, ratio? Because there are problems over there, and they're problems of mindset, skill set, and tool set, all three. And the mindset is very important, because entrepreneurship is some, some, some people think that you know it's a, it's a game of having the right feasibility. Uh, you know, that's where prudence comes in, pragmatism comes in. Because I remember when I wanted to do this business, and I'm a basically carrier franchise, a US franchise in the knowledge industry. And I was the first one to bring it into Pakistan. Uh, Franklin Covey, Stephen Covey's franchise into Pakistan because I read Seven Habits and I just got, it changed my life and I wanted more lives to change. So I go to this uh, feasibility expert in Pakistan and I say, okay, I want to set up this business and uh, I want you to tell me whether I can do this business or not. And he looks at me and he says, OK, tell me the industry growth rate. Is there industry growth? I said, no. So he said, why? I said, there's no industry like this in Pakistan. So he says, OK, uh, tell me that you want to do it from South Asia. Then it's going to be Delhi, the headquarters. Have you mitigated the risk? I said, no. I haven't mit mitigated the risk. He said, OK, so if you want to bring it, first of all, because the US had put up a condition to me that uh, you know they had this opinion that in Pakistan people walk on camels and the on only knowledge you have is on rocks and on walls and you know so they said is there a knowledge industry in Pakistan I said no but I can bring it there so I had skepticism over here and I had skepticism over there and so he said do you know how many how much resources you want uh, you know that's that was 12, 12 uh, years ago so it was expensive bringing the technology over here 
uh, do you have these resources? I said, no. So he said, okay, out of 10 things, nine are no. So you should not go for this business. I said, but I want to go for this business. So he said, only a crackpot would go for this business. So I went to my uh, mentor, and thankfully, you know what he said to me, and I remember it till date. He said to me, you know, in the leap, there's a very fine line between a crackpot and a genius. So I, I, I've tried to cross the line, but I'm still not there. <laughs> so, so that's what we require, that once you are in the field, the traditional way of doing business will not work in Pakistan. The literacy rates are low. The expertise is not available. We need to do something out of box. And so when I went forward and I started talking about this better half, uh, you know, sort of Pakistan still not being the better half over there because they are not been given the enabling environment, how to change the attitude of women over there because they are fantastic startups. There are designer clothes being made by women which are being exported. There are uh, home bakeries being turning into restaurants by friends of ours who are working from home. There are fantastic work being done by, by women, but scaling them up, making them su sustainable, that's the key. And that's where I come to the last uh, P, which is purpose. So why are we here? And why, what purpose are we here? We are here to create. We are God's creation. Some people create a song, some people create books, some people create articles, some people create products and services and ideas. And if we don't create, then there's no difference between us and this object lying over there. So when I thought about this, and I talked to this uh, uh, Stephen Covey, he, he's an American, I'm a Pakistani, he's a male, I'm a female. He's a, Mus he's a more, uh, uh, Mormon. I'm a Muslim. So, so, so all these differences, but what the common thing was purpose. And the purpose was that we want to create a difference in what we do and to other people. So that's what we want to do, that when people come in, they don't just talk about business in terms of money. They talk about business in terms of something higher. And that is why when I went into politics, um, it was because I felt that I would be able to make a larger difference when I'm in politics. And I remember uh, going door to door for uh, elections just took place uh, a couple of months ago. And I was doing a campaign in a backward area, going door to door. And because I, I'm a teacher also, so this lady opened the door and we were asking for the vote. And she said, oh, you've taught my son. Come in, come in, come in. So we went inside and she started serving tea to us. And then she asked me this question. She said. I want to ask you a question. I said, go ahead. And she said, you know, you were doing such nice work, such noble work. You were teaching. It was so clean. It was so nice. What happened to you? <laughs> you know, politics is dirty, but in Pakistan, it's not just dirty. It's filthy. So what happened to you? So she kept, and I kept on explaining to her that, you know, there is a p purpose to everything. And that's what we are here for. We are here to help people achieve their purpose, their dreams, and their destiny. And at whatever level, we need to uh, help them, enable them, and unleash them. And on the last note, I want to clear this misperception about Pakistan and about Islamic whole concept. My role model as a businesswoman was the first lady of uh, Islam, the prophet's wife, Hazrat Khadija Tussora. She was a business entrepreneur. She was the one who introduced business in ceramics, silks, furniture, trade between Mecca, Syria, Yemen. She was 15 years older than the prophet. She proposed to him, she married him, she trained him as a businessman, and together they reformed the whole economy. So this whole concept when I talk to people about that, you know, I've done all this, they say, how did they let you out of the house and how did you leave and how did you do? In Islam, women rights was the reason Islam came in. And the first lady was an entrepreneur. So when you talk about uh, the Islamic concept that PTI has of having the Islamic Republic, People say, okay, so you'll be in the Taliban era, closed down, etc. I say, no, we'll, may, we'll be in the women's rights era because that is what Islam was all about. So it's not the Swedish uh, model, it's the Islamic model that we are talking about. So imagine if we could 
have a lot of Khatija to Zora in Pakistan. We could enable them. And that's why I'm here, because we have a panel over here which has examples of that. We need to scale them up. We need to give them a purpose. We need, we need to give them the opportunity to become one of the most vibrant regions that Pakistan has the capability of becoming. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Boss. And I agree, what a great opportunity we have ahead of us. And I think that we need to get right down to it, don't we? And start looking at some great examples um, and, and looking at some strategies forward for the path forward. Um, I think if I could ask Michael to help us, I think what we would do is start with a message um, uh, from Yasmin Haider from WeNet that she has for us. Um, so if we could just press, press play on the video, please. Good evening and assalamu alaikum from Karachi, Pakistan. I am Yasmin Heather, President of Pakistan Women Entrepreneurs Network for Trade. My regrets that I was unable to be there in person due to family commitments back home, but I am very much there with human spirit and excited that an August forum like today's is focusing on women's entrepreneurship in Pakistan. I would like to thank Michael Kugelman at uh, the Wilson Center and Amber Jameer at Indus for inviting me to be part of this esteemed panel. The founder of our country, Kaide Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah, once said, there are two powers in the world. One is the sword and the other is the pen. There is a third power stronger than both, that of the women. In an effort to unleash this third power, Pakistan Women Entrepreneurs Network for Trade, WeNet, was launched last year as a nationwide network to engage women entrepreneurs on a single representative platform. Our objectives are to represent Pakistani women SMEs globally by developing linkages with regional and international trade networks and serve as an advocacy platform nationally, providing suggestions for policy formulation with regards to gender to both public and private sectors. There is a dire need to gather data on women's entrepreneurship in Pakistan, and so VNet is continually developing a database of women-led SMEs to be used for trade policy and cross-sector partnerships. Improving female economic participation through entrepreneurship is crucial for effective and sustainable development of the fragile economies of developing countries. Growth in women entrepreneurship tends to affect a country in a much more transformational way, leading to overall growth that is generally not captured by traditional measures of economic development. Thus, it is crucial to enable women to start businesses and reduce challenges for existing women entrepreneurs. Women account for approximately half of Pakistan's population, but their labor force participation rate is only 25% compared to 81.1% for men. This is unfortunate, considering the fact that women's economic participation, inclusiveness, and empowerment is recognized globally as being essential to the progress of a country and its economic growth. Thus, gender equality in employment and Entrepreneurship is imperative for Pakistan to prosper. It is also essential to promote a tax-paying culture among women entrepreneurs, as women's contribution to the economy goes undocumented due to its informal nature. Pulling women into the formal economy is integral to increase the country's tax base and create an inclusive policy framework. In Pakistan, local startups are mainly driven by a young working population. Since under 30s make up for two thirds of our population, providing a strong private sector support is crucial to ensure a promising future for entrepreneurship. VNet aims to support these young women entrepreneurs and millennials through mentoring and access to networks. 70% of women owned SMEs in developing countries are either shut out by financial institutions or are unable to get financial services that are adequate for their needs. This means that there is a $300 billion annual deficit for women-owned enterprises in terms of access to capital, according to an IFC report 2017. Moreover, in Pakistan, women cannot register a business the same way as men. Such obstacles thwart women's entrepreneurial development. Pakistan VNet has arranged one-on-one -on -one advisory sessions with banking and financial institutions to provide more information and clarity on the requirements. Some of our female entrepreneurs have adopted fintech as a solution to payments. Within our network, the challenges faced by, by 
uh, female entrepreneurs are similar to the ones discovered on a macro level. The biggest percentage of women in our network, that is small business owners, face the challenge of access to finance and dealing with government regulatory authorities. We have export-ready businesswomen who hesitate to participate in trade because of regulations and legislations. They simply need to be nudged in the right direction and provided technical advisory to scale up operations. Moreover, we look forward to contributing to the government's efforts in promoting documentation and expanding the tax base in the women SME sector. With regards to the challenge of dealing with government regulations, VNet has highlighted the impact of trade policies on women-led businesses and has advocated for women entrepreneurs and Pakistan's strategic trade policy framework. In fact, ours was the only women's network to have participated in consultative sessions to implement the national policy recommendations hosted by the Ministry of Commerce in August 2018. Furthermore, we realize that women entrepreneurs need a network more than men because they work independently in silos. Studies show that women are three times less likely to know another entrepreneur as compared to men. Hence, a network for entrepreneurs has been extremely beneficial for sharing knowledge and insights. WeNet is blessed with strong male champions who support women economic empowerment in Pakistan. In fact, we are the only country representative women's network that has a predominantly male board of advisors whose strategic guidance has enabled us to create an impact in a very short span of not even a year. We have been able to develop a database of 174 small and medium-sized business, women businesses from Karachi to Gilgit. We have provided technical advisory and company-specific trainings to 500 entrepreneurs and professionals. Our networking sessions have led to business linkages and access to markets for over 100 women-led SMEs. We can foster more women entrepreneurship in Pakistan's formal economy through promoting use of technology and providing convenient e-payment solutions, as 40% of our women entrepreneurs are engaged in online sales. With a boost in Pakistan's e-commerce, there is now a need to develop an inclusive e-commerce policy that will enable women entrepreneurs to engage in trade especially those who suffer from mobility constraints or socio-cultural issues. I am a firm believer in the power of collaboration, both globally and nationally, and the only way forward for Pakistan is for 50% of its population to be recognized as a substantial contributor to the economy. Women need to step up and participate in policy making with national institutions to develop an inclusive business ecosystem for women SMEs in Pakistan. Thank you very much and once again congratulations to Wilson Center and Indus for hosting a fantastic symposium. I look forward to new collaborations for Pakistan WeNet and welcome each of you to engage with us to build opportunities for women SMEs in Pakistan. Pakistan Zindabad. Thank you to the organizers for, for making that happen. I think that was a, a great message to make sure that was, that was heard here at the symposium. Um, let's continue now um, and turn the the microphone over to our colleague Rudaba Nasser um, from the IFC to talk a little bit about her experience and the examples that she's found um, that show broader economic impacts of inclusion of women in the economy. Rudab. Great, thank you very much, Barbara, and thanks. We have to a soccer game going on in the back, but oh, okay, wow. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we should put some cricket on. <laughs> um, and thank you to the Wilson Center and Indus for this opportunity to talk about IFC's work to support women's economic uh, participation around the world, and particularly in Pakistan. IFC, as many of you know, is a member of the World Bank Group and. The largest uh, global development institution focused exclusively on the private sector in emerging markets. We use our capital, expertise, and influence to create markets and opportunities where it's needed the most. We work directly with the private sector companies um, on financing and innovation for gender smart solutions, encouraging them to invest in growth and jobs. IFC has an active investment and advisory portfolio in Pakistan. IFC's current commitment, um, investment commitment exposure amounts to approximately 1.2 billion on account in 40 companies, primarily in infrastructure, uh, in financial institutions, in manufacturing, agribusiness, and services. IFC also has um, a vast advisory services portfolio in Pakistan uh, with 19 mandates totaling 37.5 million 
supporting access to finance for MSMEs through financial institutions, uh, improving the investment climate, improving corporate governance for SMEs, and also promoting clean energy and supporting agribusiness supply chains. Investing in women is a critical component of IFC's uh, gender strategy, actually the World Bank Group's gender strategy, and of course the SDGs. As an investor in emerging markets for over 60 years, IFC knows that investing in women is one of the smartest decisions companies can make to drive profits, growth, and innovation. McKinsey estimates that if women participate in the economy at the same rate as men, it could add up to 28 trillion to the global economy by 2025. Yet women face significant hurdles in almost all spheres of economic activity, from more traditional barriers, um, such as access to finance, skills, education, technology, and assets, to more non-traditional barriers, where some of my work lies, uh, such as social norms, sexual harassment, uh, safe transport, and childcare. Um, hence, women's labor force participation has fallen over the last 20 years. Globally, women spend three times more time on unpaid care and household work uh, compared to men. And this figure goes up to 10 times, 10 in, in uh, South Asia, in countries like India and Pakistan. And more than 1.2 billion women in low and middle income countries do not use mobile internet, which makes it harder for them to um, set up businesses and open a bank account in their own names. Yasmin already pointed towards this IFC study um, pointing towards an SME finance gap for female entrepreneurs around the world at 1.4 trillion, which is a significant missed opportunity. And globally, less than 1% of corporate procurement goes to women. And although female entrepreneurs own and operate more than one third of small and medium enterprises in emerging markets and boost growth and create jobs, they tend to be smaller and fail faster. And also in many parts of the world, women tend to be em entrepreneurs out of necessity, that is because they could not find a job or social um, norms indicate that they must work out of the home or cannot leave their home. So the challenge is to identify those high growth intentional entrepreneurs that can contribute to economic development. Yet according to the World Economic Forum, it could take more than 200 years to close this gender gap glo globally. And I'm sure we'll all agree we don't have that much time. So IFC has various programs in place to support women as employees, as entrepreneurs, as business leaders, customers, and community members. And I will focus on um, the employees and the entrepreneurship work that we're doing. Last year, we started a partnership with the Pakistan Business Council and its 80 plus member companies to advance women's employment in Pakistan's formal private sector. Now the figure that's often quoted for Pakistan's labor force participation, female labor force participation is 25 or 22. But women's participation in Pakistan's formal private sector labor force is less than 10%. Because if you take out the public sector employment, you take out women who are actively seeking employment, and you look at the private sector formal labor force participation, it's less than 10%. One of the lowest in South Asia, definitely the lowest in South Asia, and one of the lowest in the world. So what we did in this regard is to bring the private sector companies together and train them in understanding and recognizing the business case for investing in women employees. You need to re retain, uh, recruit, retain, and promote more women in the workforce, increase the number of women on boards, and for this, we, I recently just, I was in Pakistan actually um, just last week organizing Pakistan's first ever training for women on boards um, focused on female directors who want to serve on boards, who already serve on boards, and even younger women who at some point in their careers want to be on boards. And what was in interesting about this training was that we did not just focus on women because we can build up women as much as we, we, we want, but if male champions of change are not engaged, then it doesn't really make, make, make sense. So we engaged um, uh, male leaders, male champions of change, male board directors to really drive this agenda forward and also explore solutions um, that, that hamper uh, solutions to barriers to women's employment, such as childcare, sexual harassment, mobility, as I already mentioned. And as a result of our um, efforts in Pakistan, 13 Pakistani companies have made pledges to advance women in their workforce and are already implementing policies and practices uh, at, at the workforce level, um, such as childcare, with our help. 
And in December, we're launching a Pakistan-specific company good practice guide and case studies um, of Pakistani companies that are moving the needle when it comes to women's employment. Um, and we would like this to uh, inspire other companies to act as well. We also advise companies around the world, in, in Pakistan also, on how to conduct assessments to identify what are the gender gaps in their workforce, um, and then help them develop an action plan of uh, uh, solutions that they can implement to address those gaps, and then also create the necessary environment uh, to support gender diversity and equality in the workforce and gain business benefits as a result. So IFC's research also shows that companies that invest in women's employment, hire more women, retain them, promote them, can um, improve business outcomes such as um, higher productivity, lower absenteeism, lower turnover, increased <coughs> profits, um, and sustainability and employee engagement as well. For example, um, the Tackling Childcare report, which I produced last year, and now I'm leading a project to put this uh, report into practice, shows that when companies support their employees' childcare needs, because women and men have childcare needs, um, they can achieve better business outcomes, as I mentioned. And with respect to entrepreneurship, IFC's work focuses on enhancing the five Cs. Um, so focusing on capital, on confidence, capacity, connections, and contracts. And if we miss even one piece of this puzzle, of this um, ecosystem, um, initiatives are more likely to fail. So we focus on a holistic solution for women entrepreneurs. On access to capital in particular, IFC's Banking on Women program works with financial institutions around the world to boost access to finance for women entrepreneurs. At the end of June 2018, our cumulative committed portfolio totaled 1.8 billion to 74 financial institutions, including Habib Bank, in 46 countries, including Pakistan. For example, IFC partnered with Bank of BHD Lyon, um, a leading financial institution in uh, Dominican Republic, to launch a series of products for women entrepreneurs. In the year after the engagement, over 30,000 women benefited from improved access to services. The bank itself saw returns of 35% and commercial loan growth of 26%. More broadly, the program helped establish a competitive race to serve women clients. In Pakistan, IFC worked with Habib Bank Limited to develop and enhance their internal gender value proposition for uh, employees, as well as their external value proposition for female customers. We helped HBL roll out a gender sensitization training across all branches and for all HBL employees to better serve female customers, female entrepreneurs. And as a result of these efforts, the number of women-owned deposit accounts increased by 6.7%, while the volume of deposits to women-owned accounts increased by 10%. And we have seen this with our clients across the board, not just with HBL, but across the board, that those that, ha that link their internal value proposition for women employees and leaders to their external value proposition for female uh, customers um, perform better and reach more women, um, as was also the case with the BLC Bank in Lebanon. The World Bank and IFC have also launched the WeFi initiative in 2017. The first round of financing was announced in April with 120 million for three programs designed to address financial and non-financial barriers facing women entrepreneurs in developing countries, including in Pakistan. Of that amount, IFC is managing about 50 million to be dispersed over the next few, um, few months. IFC also is addressing concerns uh, and constraints around women's um, access to confidence, capacity, and connections. And our research showed that traditional tra training solutions that focus on business management do not necessarily work. They need to be combined with mentoring, training, and access to capital and markets. So where can the women take those business management skills and confidence, right? Um, and by partnering with commercial banks, IFC has launched its Women's Entrepreneurship Training Program, or Mini MBA, as it's called in Palestine, where we successfully delivered this program with the Bank of Palestine. And as a result of this mini MBA uh, in Palestine, women doubled their revenue, revenues and profits. They were able to register their businesses and create new jobs. So the number of employees um, working for mini MBA participants in Palestine increased by 28%. So there's a significant potential for job creation and job growth. And lastly, no matter how much training and financing you provide, as I mentioned, if women cannot sell their products, then there's no use, right? So hence, access to contracts and markets is key. And IFC has now entered into a partnership with WeConnect International uh, to bridge this gap. In conclusion, a few lessons that we've learned, uh, challenges that we faced um, on this path. 
um, is that training topics, whatever training topics you select for women entrepreneurs, they have to result, they have to be the result of a needs assessment that you've already done um, with the women entrepreneurs, understanding what is it that they really want. And also an understanding of the existing ecosystem is very important to see what's available in the market to support women entrepreneurs and then enter to fill that knowledge and practice gap. It is best if trainings are conducted in the local language and cater to a range of women entrepreneurs from different backgrounds and consider non-traditional barriers such as women's care needs and mobility constraints. So through my work with the Pakistan Business Council, three things I keep hearing again and again from companies that I've talked to from women employees that I've talked to, childcare, sexual harassment and safe transport are key. And they're impeding mm -hmm. uh, women's economic participation, both from the employee side and from um, the, the entrepreneurship side. And IFC has solutions and tools in place that we're trying to now uh, you know, roll out to address these three barriers. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm eager to keep in touch with you, too, and see how the project progresses. Yes. You know, you started with, I think, 13 businesses um, mm -hmm. in your project. And mm -hmm. certainly, as you see revenues uh, increase, um, perhaps, you know, linking to, to the program that you have, certainly that's going to breed competition in business um, and others may follow suit very quickly. Yeah. Thank you. The five case studies that I mentioned yeah. are going to chart that, that story. So we're going to show Perfect. how they implemented all these different um, policies and practices and what were the business benefits they gained as a result. And these are Pakistani homegrown companies, not even MNCs. So we yeah. focused on Pakistani companies that um, are based in Pakistan. Perfect. Super. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I'll turn the, the floor over to Naeem, please. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Hello. It's such a pleasure being with all of you, and it's great to be on a, on a panel on women and entrepreneurship. So it's an honor being here. And um, I'm going to talk about entrepreneurship, and I'm going to talk about Pakistan. Uh, this Pakistan is one of the most amazing places on this planet Earth. Um, it's... It's challenged. It's hugely challenged, right? It's you know, GDP per capita is 147th <coughs> in the world, which is really poor. For a country which is the fifth largest country in the world, which has such unbelievable resources, right? It's rich in every kind of resource, from, from coal to iron ore to, to, to agriculture. Uh, we've really mismanaged the country, and, 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 and it, it's been a quite a mess. But, you know... With all of that, I see the, the beauty and the power of the people and its energy and, and how it's turning around. And it's a process, right? You know, 71 years ago, we, were, uh, we, we got our freedom. And what had happened was that over the years of colonization, we really lost our sense of identity. We'd lost our purpose. We'd lost our confidence in our own selves. And it's taken, it's, it's, it's taken a long time to really get it back, and I'm seeing it happen. I'm seeing the change happen now. And I'll tell you why, and I'll tell you why I'm so excited about Pakistan. I, I, I truly believe that over the next 20 years, we're going to turn around massively, and Pakistan is going to be a prosperous, progressive country with, you know, with a really solid middle class. And with being the fifth largest country in the world, it's very well positioned in terms of market size, in terms of resources and geographical lo location. The, you know, the whole CPEC thing, people really get caught up in the infrastructure. This really minor part. It just connects us to, and integrates us into one of the most incredible markets in the world. A country which has, over the last 40 years, 40 x right, its GDP per capita. That's unbelievable. And over the next... According to the IMF, right, it's a $14 trillion economy right now. By 2030, it'll be a $30 trillion economy. That's $16 trillion of new growth coming up. And Pakistan is integrating into that economy. That's the big opportunity, the market opportunity, massive opportunity. And the, the, the thing that really excites me is that we are live in very interesting times where the entrepreneurial revolution, right, the innovation revolution is transforming the world. I, I myself uh, was part, I've been an entrepreneur five times over, twice failed, three success stories. One of them was in the telecom sector, right? I was a founding team member of this telecom company, which was started like many years ago. At that time, you know, you'd imagine, oh, we'll have, you know, 100,000 customers. But, you know, over the years, we have 50, that same company has got 50 million customers now. 
and we saw how the cellular revolution, when there were only three million people with, with, with phone lines, right? Suddenly, in, in 10 years' time, you got nearly everybody with a phone line and communicating. And that same revolution is now growing, right? Uh, just three years ago, we got broadband. Three years ago. And now you have 80% of the population having access to broadband. And only 30% of them having smartphones, right? 30%. But in the next three years, I assure you, 80% of them, there's a company that I've invested in, which is going to make phones affordable and give you free smartphones through advertising revenues, through installments, and many other ways. So there's a lot of creative innovation that's happening around it. These are revolutionary things. You, people don't realize the potential of what's going to happen because of all of that, right? This is not times for linear change. Education, healthcare, agriculture, energy, right? All of these things are going to become accessible to this population and empower their lives like never before. 71 years ago, we got out of our shackles, right, of this disempowerment. This is the age of empowerment, the age of abundance. And, and even... No matter how much we screw up, we can't stop this change. Just, I hope we can accelerate it. I hope our leadership sees the potential of it and focuses on it and taps into it because it's going to change life as we know it. And women are playing a very big role in all of this um, all across the board. Sp specifically, you know, I, I, I used to be an investor, so I've invested in many of these companies uh, over the years. For example, in microfinance, there's a woman called Roshan Zafar who started Kash Microfinance some years back. And we'd invested in her, uh, uh, and it turned out she's you know, lent to half a million women uh, over the last 20 years or so. And now five million, there are 5 million microfinance borrowers, right? of which 3 million are women. 60% of them are women. And these are entrepreneurs, the kind of confidence that these women start getting when they start building their own business and get self-employed and start that progress. The same energy, you know, uh, is, is, is lacking because they're not able to grow as fast. And I will talk about the challenges, right? Because when they become you know, successful, they're not able to grow fast enough. And the small and medium enterprise sector especially, right, hasn't been able to grow at all. Um, I think uh, Andali mentioned that 80% of employment is created by the small and medium enterprise, but they only contribute 40% of GDP. And only they're only able to access 7% of the loan portfolio of Pakistan. Pakistan is still a rent-seeking economy, right? The few control most of the wealth, but that's changing fast. And, 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 and fintech, for example, is going to be one of those variables which will massively transform that space because access to capital through fintech is incredible, right? Uh, we're already seeing it. I, I used to be on the board of something called the National Rural Support Bank, and we're launching a, a whole mobile platform where you can have access to capital. You know, uh, we charge 30% interest rates to our microfinance borrowers, right? Because the cost of lending to the poor is very high. And even though our cost of money is about, you know, 8%, but we lend it at 30% because of all the costs that go into it. But through mobile phones, that whole cost structure changes dramatically. And you can lend them at you know, 10, 12%. And that changes the dynamics. According to McKinsey, by 2025, just FinTech alone will expand the economy by 40 billion, which is about a 10% plus GDP growth just by FinTech alone, right? And create 12 million jobs. It's phenomenal, right? Um, Education, healthcare. So, uh, in healthcare, for example, there's an entrepreneur, and I, I used to run Acumen in Pakistan. Uh, it's a woman called Sara Khurram, which is running something called Sehat Khani. And in this company, what are they doing? They've, these are the two women doctors who graduated, right? And 70% of the graduates from medical schools are women because they, they study harder and they're a little smarter than most of us guys. Uh, but 70% of them drop out of the medical profession in the first five years of graduating and, and, and training as doctors. What a waste, right? But these women wanted to do something with their lives while they were raising children, and primarily because when they get married, uh, they're normally trophy wives, right? People, <laughs> and once they get married, they have children, you know, this family pressure to stay at home. But these women, these two women, started this company called Sayed Khani, which is leveraging them, right, by, uh, by, by allowing them to work whenever they can, right, uh, through telemedicine and through mobile phone app application technology. And 
it's going to be able to tap in into 70,000 doctors who are at home who want to work. And wow, what a resource that's being unlocked. And digital technology is doing it. We also have somebody here, Shazia Khan, right? She runs a, a startup called Eco Energy. And I, I was just talking to her right now. Um, and energy access for the poor, right? Uh, there's a, amazing new technology, right, which can make it affordable for the poorest of the poor, right? And it's these home systems. And she, she, her ambition just inspired me at lunch today. She plans to build her company up into a $500 million company. And there's a plan. And I've, you know, I, I believe her and reach millions of homes, right, through this solar technology and making it affordable energy for the poorest of the poor. Same thing is going to happen to education. Same thing is happening to all these sectors. And women, by the way, Andali mentioned that only 2% of these enterprises in Pakistan are run by women. But in terms of social enterprises, 20% of all social enterprises are run by women, right? So there's a much higher number of women entering into, into, into that space. Because women are naturally collaborative. One of my most successful enterprises that I've worked in was um, I used to I used to live in Silicon Valley. I used to be a venture capitalist, and I and I got inspired by meditation, right? Um, and I went back to Pakistan to teach meditation, and I found uh, the first person I worked with was and I, I, I my my co-founder was a woman, and both of us made a great team, and we built this into an amazing organization, where we taught over a hundred thousand people to, to meditate. 10,000 of them were well-to-do, right? For the well-to-do, when they meditate, they realize how interconnected they are, right? For the poor, when you teach them meditation, they realize how powerful they are. They, they experience their own power. And we run this program where really, and I'm going to leave you with three points in the end, so I'm coming to a place where when we leave them with one thought, right? And this is... And unbelievable. And this is a question you should ask yourself as a, what are you responsible for, right? And that's the question we would leave them with. And in the end, they'd come to the, this conclusion that you are responsible for everything. You can't blame anyone. When you're disempowered, you feel that you don't have the power to change your life, right? And once the poor start realizing, oh, that I'm responsible for everything, I can't blame anyone, it just changes the, the whole dynamics of power, right? and accessing their own power and their own power to be able to change the destiny. So we saw that you know, these individuals have the capacity to transform their lives when they're empowered, when they're given the belief. So the three th policy things that I will leave you with, right? One is that we need to inculcate a sense of belief in ourselves as a nation. And that's why I'm really excited. Even though I worked in the previous government, I used to be a minister in the previous government, right? I worked just for one year, and it was just a phenomenal experience. I really enjoyed being a part of the previous government. But at the same time, you know, I, wh what I love about Imran Khan and, and the new leadership, at least Imran Khan, right, is his sense of belief in himself, in his, his ability to rise up, to say, we can do it. And that's the kind of energy we need. That's what gives me faith and confidence that we can, and we will. It's, we have challenges, but once you have that spirit, you'll find a way. You'll fall a few times, but you'll get up, you'll go and make something incredible happen. And this is something we need to focus on. We need to give ourselves belief, especially for women, right? One of the uh, incubators, I'm an advisor to a, one of the incubators out of Karachi called Nestio, right? And it's run by a woman. And in the first cohort, there was only one entrepreneur uh, who was a woman. The last cohort had 55% of the cohort being women. That's phenomenal. This is a massive change just over the last five years, right? By the way, the whole entrepreneurial ecosystem is really starting to take off just now. It's just a new phenomenon. Five years ago, there was zero incubators. In just five years, there are over... 35 incubators in Pakistan, right? There used to be like less than 50 startups. Now there are over 500 startups coming up every year. And this revolution is just taking a, a hold. So belief is the one, right? And again, we really need to focus as a nation. And, 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 and women, especially entrepreneurship, when they believe in themselves and see somebody else doing it, we haven't had enough role models out there. We really need to get out there and, and create those role models. So we have Shazia, we have the leaves of the world, and many more who are transforming that. Belief is one. Second one is 
really finances, right? Where there is for the microfinance, we saw that once they even get expensive capital at 30%, it's, they start changing their lives, right? And the small and medium entrepreneurs, again, if they get a little bit of capital, they start changing, they start growing. And, 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 and venture capital, oh my God. Instead of, you know, they've been talking about raising $8 billion to build a dam. If they just took out $1 billion from that, I'm telling you the kind of impact it'll have on the venture capital and, and, and the kind of solutions we can bring to market. Nearly every challenge of ours, including water, energy, they can be fixed. There are solutions out there, right, which are more innovative. So finance is a key one. Right? And we've got to make sure there's uh, finance available. And the third one is really ease of doing business. Right? When I used to be the when I was the chairman at the board of investment, this is one one thing we found, which was the biggest impediment, right, for the small and medium enterprises. Because you know, for the rich, the ones who are doing rent seeking, they benefit from it being very difficult to do business, right? Because it stops competition from from coming in, and it forces those who are corrupt to work around the system, right? And really, this is what really messes us up. We gotta make it easy to do business. We are ranked 147 out of 192 countries. That's terrible. And hopefully this year, a little bit of work we did, we started building some traction towards it. Hopefully the numbers will improve this year's, in this year's ranking. Uh, but we have to, while I was there, we made a plan. And, and the plan was to be in the top 10, right? In the next five years. And it's doable because, you know, you just need to role model who's doing it best in the world, right? Just copy the processes. Everything's available out there in this day and age. And it's not that difficult to do. And the biggest driver within that is digitalization. Digitalization can change government. and doesn't take that long to change things, right? Like we, it used to take 28 days to start a company. We, we did some initial digitalization. Now we can do it in four hours online, right? And it can be done in minutes if you really want to. And, and, and so digitalization, simplification, and getting government out of things is the way forward. These things, it cannot be done overnight, but in the next five years, we can get there. And if you are in the top 10 or top 50 even in terms of ease of doing business, you create an environment where the small and medium entrepreneurs can grow. And with a little bit of capital and belief, we will have a revolution on our hands, right? I, had organized a conference uh, on, uh, on how do we get to 9% GDP growth rate. And it was unbelievable, right? When we put it out there, we got all these, like, we had 100 speakers, it was a whole day event, and nearly everybody, when, when they started th putting their minds to it, they found ways to get us there. And it's easy. China did it for like 30 years. They did over 10%. And for a country where we're starting at yeah, close to, you know, uh, <laughs> as low as it can get, it's quite easy. Nine, if you just do 9% GDP growth rate for the next 20 years, right, you can quadruple your GDP per capita over the next 20 years. That takes you into a middle-income country. 9% is very easy to do for Pakistan. And with, with technology, disruption, right, and innovation, it's going to become much easier. And in this digital age, where in Pakistan, where a lot of women have a disadvantage of not being able to go to the workplace because they're inconvenient, you can be at home and you can be running the world, right? And this is a huge moment in time where women are going to be involved in the global marketplace, sitting in, the, in their homes if they choose to. And this level of opportunity was never there. And it's opening up to all of us. I met uh, this really phenomenal woman who came out of a small village in Sindh Right, um, she had a, uh, she was a bonded laborer, and 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 through the internet, right, she she learned to learn uh, stuff, and um, and she had some access through some some means, and now you know I I, I met her in the U.S. Uh, uh, like a year back, and she lives in New York, and she is and she was she was very brilliant, right? She, she's super smart. She's a genius. And therefore, she was able to find a way because she was so bright, she found a way. This was not possible even 10 years ago, right? Now, because of the internet, you, they have access everywhere. If you're smart, you have the talent, you can make things happen. Everything is, is becoming possible. This is the age of empowerment. That's why I'm very, very excited about Pakistan because all our challenges are massive opportunities. And therefore, this is the best place to be if you're an entrepreneur. 
Thank you very much. <laughs> I think as we continue our discussion, if you'll indulge me for a minute, I'd like to test a theory that um, my colleagues and I have been talking about over at SIPE on you. Um, if you look at uh, women in Pakistan's economy, um, and you think of it as a pyramid, and at the top of the pyramid you have uh, very powerful women, perhaps part of the elite, um, that are wealthy, that, that don't necessarily need investment. They've, they've been able to do well on their own. And if you look at the very bottom of the pyramid as those um, entrepreneurs that you, you have described as um, entrepreneurs out of necessity, those that are focused simply on livelihoods, that a, a small amount of credit or something ha is able to change their lives. Um, the theory that we have is that while that's important and that has made great gains, it perhaps has not had the multiplier effect that um, could really unlock uh, the, the growth opportunity for women entrepreneurs in Pakistan. And so where does it leave the, the, the middle sector in the pyramid, the, the small and medium enterprise sector? Um, first of all, do you agree with that theory? And then second of all, um, what are maybe three priorities or three strategies <coughs> that should be focused on to unlock the potential of that small and medium enterprise sector? And I'll ask both of our, our panelists. Again, I just, like I said, it has to become much easier to do business, right? Because mm -hmm. right now it's too complicated and, mm -hmm. and too difficult. But it's becoming much easier. Like I said, like you, should, you have to fill out 25 forms right. to open a bank account. Now you can open a bank account online, digitally, right, within 15 seconds because everybody's bi uh, you know, biometrically verified. Massive change. So uh, ease of doing business, access to capital. Again, fintech is going to play a huge role in that, right? Access to capital. And third is belief, right? Really giving them more confidence because these these women at the bottom of the pyramid, they don't, they just don't have the confidence. And once they start seeing each other, that they see role models, it starts changing. Somebody's got to give them the belief that they can do it, mm -hmm. and it starts happening. Absolutely, Rudabha, would you like to? Great. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, holistic solutions that address the five C's, um, so addressing needs, needs of capital, but also the confidence, the capacity, the connections, and access to markets. Um, also, I think as women expand their businesses, we need to improve their access to risk mitigation tools, so mm -hmm. access to insurance, uh, just helping them hedge their bets and just take, because sometimes that leap of faith, mm -hmm. and it's a confidence game as well, sometimes that leap of faith is very hard for a woman who's used to running the business from her home or has not had that exposure. So are there any instruments we can put in place, some insurance, uh, you know, uh, health insurance, even business insurance, uh, that we can provide for them to make it easier? And then also, in addition to doing business, I think addressing and our colleagues at the World Bank with the Women, Business, and the Law team has done a fantastic job of charting out legal differences between men and women Mm -hmm. So um, we need to make it also easier for women in particular to do business. So are there any legal restrictions uh, in terms of hours worked or um, do they need their husband's permission to get an ID card or a passport or to start a business or register a business? There are these or perhaps zoning perhaps issues. zoning issues. All of that. We need to have uh, we need to sort that out. So any legal restrictions hampering women's ability to do business. And then we need more data. Mm -hmm. I think. Uh, in Pakistan, we need to understand, have enough sex disaggregated data to understand what the gaps are, mm -hmm. and how then we can design the right policies to, to address those gaps. So I would see, say the five Cs, risk mitigation tools, uh, policies uh, that um, are making it difficult for women to um, start up businesses or enter the workforce or work, and data. Thank you. Thank you both. I know that we are still hoping that uh, our other panelists um, can join us. Uh, she's on her way from the airport, so we'll see how that goes. But in the meantime, let's open it up for discussion um, and take a few questions, please, sir. Uh, and if we could, if you could just uh, wait for the microphone and also give us your name and your affiliation. Yes, hi, this is Shazad Habib from Indus, a very informative panel. Uh, thank you for the comments. Uh, I had a question uh, more about venture capital in Pakistan, and uh, I guess the question is more about uh, there is a sense that venture capital is emerging in Pakistan, but yet in the West there's a sense that it's still at a nascency stage, so any any comments on that would be useful. And I guess the second comment uh, related to that 
and to the women's pa- is do women have access to venture capital in Pakistan? And and if not, what is the potential future of what that would look like uh, from your from your standpoint? Thank you. So uh, venture capital is a new phenomenon in Pakistan. Um, th- there was one which was started about 15 years ago, TMT Ventures. It and didn't do too well. And since after that, not much happened. But now, uh, over the last couple of years, we're starting to see the emergence of that uh, category. But still, it's, it's you know, it, Pakistan has been able to uh, get, attract, say, $50 million of venture capital a year, right, in Pakistan. While in India, right, venture capital and private equity is raising about $5 billion a year. So it's very much under uh, the, you know, uh, 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 below uh, our requirement, we really need to 10x it over the next few years to be and 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 and, and make make this a, a major asset class. Um, th- so a lot of entrepreneurs and uh, like there's Shazia over there. She's right now raising a, a round of mon- uh, funding, and it's taken a long time. She she spent eight years right. So it's much harder raising money in Pakistan. Uh, with her idea, what she was working on, she should have done it a few years back, right? Uh, and just because it's Pakistan, it just takes much, much longer to convince people and to raise the money. So this is one area where the diaspora, and again, in tomorrow's uh, session, they, the diaspora c- can play a very big role in terms of bringing the know-how to do the, the venture capital industry and the funding for it as well. Uh, my name is Kami, but thank you very much for w- your very insightful presentation. And my question is about the general contempt uh, for ladies uh, in uh, Pakistan, or sp- I mean in many Muslim countries. And my question is, do you think Benazir was assassinated by M- Musharraf Goon or by Pakistani army <laughs> just because she was a woman? Because, you know, they killed her, uh, her dad, but there was a, some legal process they followed. Whereas in the case of a woman, they just didn't give care and they just eliminated her in public. So uh, my question is, again, does it have to do anything with Islam? Because I'm, I, I mean, many conservative Republicans in America think that Islam doesn't give enough respect or sufficient respect to women. So I- is that the reason? Thanks. Please, believe me. There was a collective request <laughs> for Ms. Abbas to join us for this. <laughs> uh, well, um, well, well, well. <laughs> um, I think, uh, let me just be very open about it. One, of course, uh, we are lucky that uh, we had a female leader. America still is waiting for one. Um, but as far as... Uh, I think it's more of the position, not the gender. Anybody, like I was just mentioning when I was uh, talking earlier on in my uh, spotlight speech, um, politics all over the world is dirty, but it's much dirtier in this part of the world. So I think it was not just that, that she was a woman. I think it was her position that other people wanted. And uh, so I think it's not gender-based. It is if you're at that level over there and you're bringing or you are taking control of certain mafias, you're challenging certain norms, you are uh, sort of trying to bring a change, your life is going to be at risk uh, in these countries because those mafias have established themselves over a period of 70 years. Even now, while we are uh, there in the government, uh, the security uh, agencies tell us that uh, you know, they're life threats because uh, the traditional mafias which are there as far as uh, businesses are concerned, media is concerned, uh, the status quo were there, uh, they are not willing to let that happen. So I don't think so. Benazir was uh, assassinated because she was a woman. She was assassinated because she was challenging certain uh, traditional norms over there. Thank you. Thank you. In the back, uh, the lady with the blue scarf, please. And maybe we can actually take two or three questions if that's fair, to, to make sure we get them all in. So uh, my name is Amna Freen. I'm a visiting scholar at Georgetown University. So um, Mr. Naeem, like, so hopeful, but uh, I'm kind of pessimistic person. I don't know <laughs> because of the numbers especially. So my question is, all three of you, that how do you see the illiteracy rate of women in Pakistan? 
So if we contrast the literacy rate and those dramatic marketing digital world, so how do you see that? Very good, thank you. And if you don't mind, we'll take maybe two more before we start, okay. Uh, uh, maybe just continuing down the row there, if you don't mind, the gentleman. Thank you, my name is Malik Siraj Akbar. I'm a journalist from Pakistan. Uh, taking a step back uh, with respect to talking about the future entrepreneurs, what's the landscape in Pakistan with STEM education with a special focus on women, like initiatives like Girls Who Code? What's the situation in Pakistan? What, how big is the scope and what's being done in terms of preparing girls for science and technology and mathematics? Thank you. Very good, thank you. And I believe, it, uh, Amber, please. Thank you so much. I am Amber uh, with Indus. Um, the question I have is I'm, I'm particularly, particularly intrigued with a certain subset of women potential entrepreneurs. Uh, we know that this is a country where 60% of the population is under the age of 25 years of age. We also know that there's been some significant gains made in tertiary education. So when you think about that group of young women somewhere in the you know, 25 years of age, who have made some great gains in terms of education, what do you think the landscape is? What is the immediate need that this group has so that we can really create, um, you know, leverage the resources that have been put into this group and allow a ripple effect to take place? Super, thank you very much. Why don't we go ahead and mm -hmm. turn to our panelists. So the questions were on literacy, STEM education, and kind of unlocking that, that power of that group of of, of young women mm -hmm. that have made gains in education. Um, Great. Please. So I'll take the one on STEM and also on um, the younger age group. So on STEM, what we're trying to do in Pakistan is we're working with the companies um, across sectors uh, to encourage them to think about uh, recruiting, retaining, and promoting more women in non-traditional roles, so as engineers, um, so particularly with one company in the textile industry out of Faisalabad, we're working with them to see how they can reach more female engineers. Um, don't tell us that female engineers don't exist. They exist. You need to find them, need to train them, need to give them that opportunity to come into the, to the workforce. If they can see a trajectory, a career path for themselves, that okay, we're gonna go to engineering school, I'm going to uh, get trained as a textile engineer or an industrial engineer or a mechanical engineer or electrical engineer, and then I can actually get employed. So there's that career path. If we can show that, um, then more and more women would want to be in this, uh, in, in this field. So we're actually putting it on the private sector to create that environment, create that demand, absorb uh, the, the female engineers, give them those opportunities so that they not just join the workforce but are able to stay in the workforce. So creating that environment as well. So because it's hard being the only industrial engineer on the floor or the only women on the board. So we need to create that environment where their voices are heard. So we have a number of different projects and tools in place where we're creating, helping Pakistani companies create that environment uh, to, to, to do that. And one of the interesting things that some of the Pakistani companies have started doing is that they're going into the universities. They already you know, try to get the female engineers who are um, you know, about to graduate or just a few uh, months away from gra graduation and get them there so that mm -hmm. they don't drop out, they don't look elsewhere, or they don't think this is impossible, right? So they're going into uh, universities to do that. Um, younger age group, so I also lead IFC's Millennial Resource Group, so I'm constantly uh, looking at research, talking to millennials across the board, and um, it is so important uh, for, and, and I've seen this through my research and my conversations, for millennials to see that clarity of you know, the, the career path, the trajectory, that okay, I'm going to school for this, uh, will I be able to get a job? Will I be able to progress in that career? Will I be able to move forward? So if we can make it tra more transparent, easier, um, for them to enter the workforce or, or become an entrepreneur, I think that that is where we might lose them, right? They graduate and then they just stay at home. They're like, 
okay, I, I can't do this. So that's where we need to get them. And companies can make an effort. Uh, banks can make an effort to target uh, young entrepreneurs um, and also donors and NGOs can, can really build that capacity right out of uh, college. Um, so yeah, over to you. Uh, I also have a TV show. It's called Idea Karoroka, which is basically a shark tank of Pakistan. And, you know, we have two million people who view it every week. And what's great is 60% of the audience is women, right? So that shows there's interest amongst women. And the average age of that audience is about 25, right? So it's a very young audience. Uh, so, so there's a desire, right? Uh, interest in doing something with it. Now, I, I don't know how, how much of it is, you know, gets converted into a real opportunity. But what we're seeing now, right, initially we had about 5% of the applicants coming in for, uh, to pitch were women. Now we got 25%, right? So it's been a, over the last three years, over three seasons, right, it's gone up five folds, which is brilliant. So change is happening. It just, again, like I said, you, they need role models, they need success stories. And regarding STEM education, this, so we had in the, in the last show, this weekend's show, uh, on Sunday night, um, it's and again we get prime time right eight o'clock on Sunday night is our show. Uh, was this woman who who had children and she wanted them to learn about science and she's making these you know these toolkits where kids and videos right through, through which kids can make uh, robots etc. And it's priced at fifteen dollars right. So a whole different market segment. There's great demand for these kind of things, and uh, she was trying to raise. Uh, $200,000 to scale it up. So it's brilliant. It's, it's starting to happen. It's, it's still early, but you know the way these things take off, it's always slow. It, you can't, it, it, but when it, the inflection point happens, it just goes sky high. Same thing happened in the cellular industry, right? It was like you know, really slow growth, but there was an inflection point where it just took off. Like I said, I believe the inflection point is going to happen over the next three to five years, right? With smartphone adoption, where everybody's going to have a smartphone. Uh, such an incredibly powerful tool to change, to educate yourself. We talked about educational gap. The kind of, I've seen entrepreneurs coming up with games, understanding the psychology of, of, of the children and figuring out what would attract them uh, to make, there's some, uh, I've seen a startup which had um, which which in a, with 40 hours of video and game playing you can make, get basic literacy skills right for anybody for free right and they're going to make money through again uh, by building a community etc this is revolutionary right for free you can get educated get basic literacy skills now again you need motivation to get there right to be but the, the whole idea that what they're working on is to make it so much fun and ad addictive right it becomes a game you get dopamine effect, right? You, every time you do something, you feel, oh, I've done something. You get validation. That's what these people are looking for. So you're going to use these things to our advantage. You know, in the West, the whole world is going to be disrupted, right? In the next 10 to 20 years, our w lives are going to be completely disrupted. But for countries like Pakistan, it is this disruption, this only way is up, right? We have nothing. For, it'll make things accessible like never before, right? The marginal cost of energy will come down close to zero. Education, healthcare, all these things is going to come down and make it accessible and empowering for everyone. Thank you. Adlib, I don't know if you want to also maybe address the literacy yeah. issue specifically. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think, uh, uh, you know, there has to be a unequal... Uh, focus by the government on female literacy, and that's by intent. Uh, what we have seen is that constitutionally, we have a 25A clause which says that free education to girls and boys uh, are a constitutional responsibility of the government, but the governments have uh, failed so far. So w the things that need to be done and the things that we are putting in our policy plan also are basically that <coughs> Something that we did in uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and did very, very successfully, which I mentioned earlier on, that all new schools, 100 if they are made, 70 will be for girls, 30 will be for boys. Also, the girls will be encouraged to, once they grow up, have a diversity of opportunities. So for example, the first uh, girls cadet college has been made in Mardan KP. So these girls are going to be trained to take up uh, 
you know, uh, military assignments and other assignments. We had this uh, video which was viral by a 13-year-old, and she said, I, had a dream, I have a dream that I'm going to be Pakistan's next COAS, you know, chief of the army staff. So a girl being the chief of the army staff, uh, I think it's fantastic. The other thing is that what we've done uh, in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa when we were in the government, and we are going to be doing it over here as well, parents who are not sending their daughters to school uh, by choice or by social norms or by whatever, uh, because education has to be free. So if they're not sending them to school, uh, they will be fined. There will be a fine for parents who are not sending their children to school, and there are penalties on it. So it's mandatory for them to send them. Plus, of course, it's a push and pull. Uh, so the pull is that one of the reasons parents don't send them to public schools is because the level of uh, the quality of education is so low. So what we've done is that on the one hand, of course, we'll have this legislation to push parents to send them to school. The other is that improve the quality of the education. So for example, in our province that we were in government, 50% attendance by teachers. 50% of the teachers did not come to school. Right? So now the attendance is 98%. And about 40% teachers were on political basis. Uh, they were not capable to teach. So now it's all on merit. And now we have awards for teachers who have uh, got the best results in public schools. And that's what our aim is, that until and unless public schools are equal to private schools, we are changing the three, three different levels of uh, education. There's the madrasa education. There is the private school education, which is only about less than a million people go to private schools. And then there's the mass public uh, school education. We are making the syllabus one for all three of them. And we are making sure that the same quality, same syllabus, same studies are going to be available for uh, uh, students uh, in the next coming four or five years. We've started that process and had a lot of success in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, and we are going to do that uh, to improve the education level in Pakistan, hopefully by 2023. Terrific, thank you. Sure. There was a gentleman here on the left, and then maybe we can come back here on the front. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Asif Khan. I work for an uh, NGO called Helping Hand for Relief and Development, and we are investing about uh, $10 million in Pakistan on average for the last 10 years. And uh, part of my question, you already answered uh, about the education because we have public schools or government school, we call it there, and then we have a private schools. And uh, what I have seen last uh, at least 20 plus years, um, the public schools have gone really bad in their you know, infrastructures and teachings and all that. And then private schools are booming. Uh, everywhere you see that like everybody who has uh, some space in his house opening up a private schools. And uh, I like to, I know you already addressed part of it, but what can you do to combat and bring this uh, public schools uh, education so uh, at the level of what private schools are doing so people instead of sending their kids to private school, they send them to public school? Thank you. And I think the gentleman here in the front row, and I believe the, 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 the right. right behind, <laughs> uh, here in the front row. Uh, oh, that's, that's fine. I just want to make sure that we get the gentleman here. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shazia Khan. Uh, Naeem, thank you for your glowing uh, recommendation and, and endorsement. I'm really excited that you guys are all here today and that uh, Michael, the Wilson Center, made this panel happen and you know made it a priority. This should definitely be part of the discussion. I just want to make a quick comment about, um, and hopefully you'll allow me that, being uh, a female entrepreneur working in Pakistan. Uh, and then also I'd like to make a quick comment about where I see the future um, of women's employment going as a company that's scaling. And then I do have a question. Um, so Naeem was right. It took me, I, I started Eco Energy. We bring um, affordable uh, solar energy solutions to off-grid populations. Uh, I started. The, I came up with this idea because, as a child visiting uh, visiting Pakistan, I saw that so many people didn't have access to electricity. And you know, long story short, I really believe that making uh, energy affordable to people living in off-grid areas is critically important because 40% of the population can't contribute to the national or local economies. And you know, it's uh, really like a energy access is a critical part of Pakistan's path forward. 
Uh, so I launched Eco Energy in 2010, and I didn't spend the last eight years raising money. What I did was I spent seven years building a business case not using private investment money, but I spent seven years building the business case because this is a huge mm -hmm. issue, right? How do you make energy affordable? How do you make electricity affordable to people who are living at the bottom of the pyramid, right? And so I knew that this wasn't gonna be, a, this wasn't gonna be an overnight journey. I knew that it would take a very long time to build a business case for this, but once we were able to do it, um, I knew that we would get the momentum behind us that we needed. So I spent four years doing extensive market research. I literally went door to door. My skeletal team of uh, 12 people covered 50,000 households <coughs> from which we collected data about people's purchasing power, consumer preferences. Then I spent three years market building to figure out the right product market fit. Um, and then also where should we sit on the value chain. And then only in 2017 did I launch Eco Energy Global, a private company that was just going to set out to raise, I set out to raise a million dollars in investment, and I'm getting ready to close six million dollars. On top of it, a three million dollar grant. <laughs> and an so it is possible. It's definitely possible, you know? You have to have the purpose, you have to have the drive, you have to have the intellectual curiosity and the grit to stick it out, because it's gonna take a long time. It's a really big, big problem. You know, and I wasn't arrogant enough to figure out, feel that I had the answer, but I could leverage technology. I could leverage the fact that I was an American and that I was fully invested in the Pakistani American diaspora community. So the first million that I raised came from the Pakistani American diaspora community, which I think is really, really <laughs> And it gave me the momentum that I needed. I also raised almost $2 million from crowdfunding platforms. Um, and then the rest, institutional investors obviously came, uh, you know, scrambling after us once we had had 500% year-over-year uh, growth. Um, so it is a difficult journey, but it's, it's definitely not impossible. Um, and uh, I would uh, love to engage with you guys uh, further to talk about my journey of raising capital. Once I had the business model down, um, it really wasn't that hard. So in empowering or training women, if that's uh, what the focus is going to be for women's entrepreneurship, is, is it's really important. You do have to figure out what the business model is before investors are gonna come on board and support you. So that's part of my journey. It's been a, a very happy one. And I'm happy to say that I was pregnant when I launched the company and I raised two kids <laughs> while I was doing it because except for the one week a month that I travel, um, I work from home in my pajamas all day long. <laughs> and it's awesome. So now the second part of this equation is um, as a female CEO, 50% of my 50% of my first uh, round uh, investors, the uh, the diaspora community, were women. 50% of my board is women, um, and then uh, the chairman of our board is a woman, and then the CEO is a woman. My partner is a very awesome guy. <laughs> I don't mean to leave him out, but um, uh, we're very very interested and excited about hiring women as we scale. We have. Uh, 65 employees right now. Next year, we'll have 143. In 2021, we'll have well ho over uh, 350. And all of the people that we employ are in Pakistan, and they live out in these rural areas. We only hire from the communities in which we work. And, you know, it's funny because I've noticed such a change over the last eight years. Earlier on, when I used to go on field visits, these ladies just used to think probably that I was a secretary and nobody was interested in talking to me. Over the last two years, women are, or they used to say, Madam, are you here to build us a school or can you give us a school? And I was like, no, that's not what I'm here for. But now when I go, really like huge groups of women will come up to me and I'm like, do you know who I am? And they were like, we know who you are. I'm like, how do you know who I am? I've been trying to fly under the radar. Oh, well, I'm educated and I went to Tutta and I looked you up on the internet because I heard you were coming and I want a job. They are coming, they are young women. The youth bulge is quite real in Pakistan. These are young women and they want a job. So we've been hiring women. Now the obstacles that they face are very real and they're not that different from the ones that I faced around childcare, work-life balance. How do you, I mean, of course my husband's not trying to tell me that I'm not allowed to go outside, so it's not exactly the same. But for these women, there's lots of opportunities to work remotely and I wanna hire them. I want within the next three years for 50% 50% of my staff to be women, whether that's in a senior management position or whether it's out in the field. And I have to put certain building blocks in place to be able to, to make sure that those women can do it. Now, first we started hiring women that were right out of college or graduate school into senior management positions. And as within a year after they got married, they all left. It was awful and very annoying because we spent a lot of money training them. But what I have noticed is that women that we hire after they've had their kids, and I give them the ability to work remotely, which I give to all of my staff, men and women, 
these women stick. We have an 85% retention rate amongst our staff because not only that, we offer them, despite their education or their professional background, opportunities to move laterally and to move up. And to move, we have somebody that came in as a customer service rep and we had her move up and she's running marketing now because that was her desire and she was able to prove herself. So there are ways to do this that take into consideration the, the, the cultural norms. Um, you just have to, as a company, be willing to make accommodations and adjustment to give those women opportunities. Um, so my final question, so my actual question for you guys is, um, how can companies like EcoEnergy, who are maybe not large multinational companies that the IFC usually engages with, how can growing, scaling companies like mine, which I imagine to have, uh, I, I hope, will have a thousand employees within the next seven years, how can we work together and engage with you to make sure that these women have this? Not all these women want to be entrepreneurs, by the way. A lot of them just want a job. And I'm happy to give them a job and to accommodate them because I know that they're loyal employees. So uh, that's all I have to say. Great, thank you. Yeah, and I think there was another, uh, and if we could pass up to the front row actually, uh, sir, the, the microphone's right behind you. Thank you. I'll be brief. <laughs> 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 I, I have a question. Uh, I think Mr. Zamindar talked about uh, macro financing in Pakistan. Could you tell us a few success stories and you know how how well it is going in Pakistan? And I have a question for um, about the public and private schools, you know, being the same in Pakistan. Uh, I I am in favor of it. I hope uh, that happens soon, but I think it's going to take some time. Uh, my question to the three panelists is. Um, how many of you are from public school and how many from private school? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Let's, let's, um, let's table that for now and then we'll come back for more questions in a minute. Um, if you remember, the, the first question from the gentleman um, talked about the sort of gap between the public and government schools and the private schools um, and how to close that gap and make the uh, public government schools more competitive. Um, and then Shaza was talking about how can we work together, um, you know, as a scale-up company to, to make sure that those women that want to be entrepreneurs are achieving their, their dreams. Um, and then the, the last question from our, from our, um, from our colleague was um, about the, the public-private schools and, and how many of us are, how many of us, including me, are from public schools <laughs> um, and, 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 and otherwise. I don't know that I count, though, because I was from, I'm from Pennsylvania. <laughs> Please. Private school. Private, but born and raised in Pakistan, so Pakistani private school. Um, private school, but I'd just like to address the Please, question because yeah. it's relevant to, um, you're absolutely right, and, you know, the difference between uh, U.S. and other countries and Pakistan is that the difference between a private and a public school is like zero to 100 uh, in Pakistan and I would like to you know sort of just uh, mention the things that and you must be aware of them that 70 percent of public schools do not have toilets washrooms and they 40 percent schools don't have boundary walls 35 percent schools do not have drinking water you can imagine a child going in such circumstances to study what can they study? So the first thing that we did was, when we took government in Khyber uh, Pakhtunkhwa, was to make a basic skills upgradation, furniture, furnishing plan. That all schools, and that there were tw 28,000 schools at that time we were targeting, will have, you know, there, was, there were schools which did not have elect electricity for three months. There were schools in which three classes were taught in one small room. So it's difficult for you people over here in this country to imagine such conditions, but 90% of Pakistanis were studying in those schools. And you can imagine that if basic facilities are not present, how can anybody even force people to send the, uh, children on the, even, even if they're free of cost? Plus the teachers, like I told you, the ratio of the teachers over there. So the first thing was to upgrade them and make them livable, habitable, where basic human facilities are present over there. Imagine you don't have electricity, don't have a bathroom, don't have water to drink, then what are you? Are you sending your people to Dead Sea or what? So that, that is the state of schools over there. So we are going to be, now that we are in government, that's the first plan. 
upgrade the facilities over there that requires huge amount of capital also resources and budget also you can imagine uh, there are lakhs and lakhs of schools and they all lack these facilities so it will take some time for them to equip them with basic facilities second of course is the question of quality of education and the quality of education there there's a two pr uh, pronged approach one is the curriculum to make it modern now for for example madrasas we have 2.5 million st children studying over there and it's because of poverty and if we blame that these children are coming out and they are not contributing productively or they are becoming terrorists or whatever well look at what what the curriculum is being taught so you have to bring them in the mainstream line. You have to be inclusive and engaged with them. Why isn't a judge and a uh, lawyer and an engineer and a doctor coming out of them? Because the curriculum over there and the conditions over there are so bad that you, you don't expect them to be anything but resentful when they see the more privileged classes living differently. So you have to remove this difference between the education system. Education system has brought a class difference, a mindset difference, and it is creating such resentment in the country of those who can speak English and those who can't, those who are, have degrees which they can go and get employment from. And IFC will be knowing that because I've taught in LUMS and I've taught in the best universities in Pakistan. When we, and I teach business, so when people go out from there, uh, you know, and they give interviews to companies and they can't speak proper English and can't write a single email properly, even if they are master's degree, they don't get jobs. So you coming out of these institutions at all levels, getting master's degree, not getting jobs, becoming aware and becoming even more upset and resentful. So our, our whole focus is how do we upgrade physical facilities? How do we improve the level of teaching? How do we diversify opportunities for people to be gainfully engaged, constructively, uh, inclusively coming into the foray of life and business as such? It's a tall ask, but without that, there's going to be no change. Education, health, and environment are the three top priorities of this government. Okay, thank you. Okay, questions or the responses? Uh, regarding the microfinance, uh, there are 5 million borrowers in Pakistan, but you know the need is for at least 30 million uh, t potential target uh, uh, borrowers. In Bangladesh, there are 30 million borrowers, right? Pak so very similar uh, in terms of population, etc. So, so it's st still very underserved, and there's massive potential. And again, digitalization and using mobile phones will be a great way of being able to extend reach to many more people and, and having access to capital for them. So yes, uh, it's thriving. Interest rates are very high. It averages thirty percent, versus you know normal banking uh, customers would have to pay ten to twelve percent. So it's significantly higher, and we need to reduce that too. Great on um, what IFC is doing and can do. So multiple ways. Uh, we're conducting research on the business case. I think that's critically important to make the case for uh, women's economic participation. We're collecting the data, and I have with me uh, these case studies, and you're welcome to have a look. We're telling the stories of women entrepreneurs like you, getting the stories out there, inspiring other women entrepreneurs, making it easier for them, um, and making them think that this is possible. And it's possible because they can have access to capital, they can have access to connections, um, to, to uh, contracts, to capital, to confidence. So all of that, we're trying to tell the stories through case studies, through um, role models, as you mentioned as well. So collecting the data, presenting the data, and the business case research is very important because unfortunately, uh, globally, people still don't understand the business case. They come at this from a human rights perspective. Oh, we have to do this, we have to hire this woman because it's the right thing to do. No, fine, it's the right thing to do, but it's also good for your business. It's also gonna bring all these productivity gains and the different things that I talked about. So making that business case is very important. The other thing we're doing is bringing partners together. IFC and the World Bank have this convening power and we can use that to bring different um, par parties together. So what we've done is we recently launched a digital to equal partnership, which is bringing together different digital platforms that in turn employ millions of women, um, for example, um, yeah, as, as drivers or as home-based workers. So 
we are bringing all these companies together to, to think through how they can improve opportunities for women, how they can improve their employment practices, um, their con contracting practices, they can collect the right data and fill those gaps. So bringing all these different parties together is another thing that we're focusing on. And then, as I mentioned, addressing the non-traditional barriers that often get left behind when people are pushing the access to capital and finance agenda forward, things like childcare and sexual harassment and safe transport sometimes fall back. So what we're doing is to bring attention to that. For example, just because a woman is of childbearing age or you think she might get marri married and leave your workforce doesn't mean you shouldn't hire her. That's discriminatory employment practice and that's not good. You should hire the woman and then create the necessary environment or give her the right policies or the right accommodations like breastfeeding rooms, like toilets, yeah, like a childcare facility, maybe a community-based childcare center or a partnership with the government or something to address those constraints, to address the social values issue. If you think it's a social norm issue, if you think it's a infrastructure issue, then bring your business acumen and your um, you know, money behind that and, and hire that woman even if you think that you know, she might leave, because she leaves not because she wants to leave, but oftentimes she leaves because uh, that's, that's how it is and that's how the uh, workplace environment is structured. And, but we're trying to change that through our Tackling Childcare initiative. We're working very closely with the companies and then we receive this, um, this demand or this, you know, we continue to talk to our stakeholders, con continue to talk to the companies, to the employees, and then they asked us, to look into community-based childcare models because a lot of the times companies set up daycare centers and they're empty because women just don't want to bring their kids to the factory, to the indus industrial area. So we're now looking into how we can support or get the private sector to support actually uh, community-based childcare centers in the communities where women live so that they can leave their kids in a high quality, uh, safe, healthy environment, come to work and, and then be at peace. So some of the things that we're thinking through also on sexual harassment, IFC has developed and is now rolling out uh, the sexual harassment training. We, we don't call it sexual harassment because people are like, what, we didn't do any sexual harassment. So we're trying to make it look like it's respectful workplaces. Let's all build a respectful mm. workplace, which is good for women, good for men, and Harassment can be of different forms. Sexual is one of them, but there's also verbal, mm -hmm. there's physical. On the factory floors, if, yeah, it, it, it can get physical, it can get verbal. So we're trying to build respectful workplaces and we have tools to do that. Um, and we're doing this not just in Pakistan, but also in East Asia Pacific, in Papua New Guinea, in Solomon Islands, um, in these um, conflict affected um, uh, low income and fragile areas as well where, where no one wants to go. But we are going there to, to impart this training to uh, help build these respectful workplaces. And, on, and public transport is, is linked to that because a lot of the harassment takes place when women are traveling to and yeah. from work. And that doesn't mean that women should just stay at home just because there's harassment outside. So no, you should work from home. No, we give them the option to choose. If they want to stay at home, great. But if they want to go out, they should have that option. So we have uh, trainings around that and helping the private sector to think through solutions and not just think of this as a cost center. Um, oh, we have to invest so much money because we are hiring a bus service is hard or setting up a daycare is hard. But we're making them again, coming back to the business case that this is an investment now, but it's going to reap returns mm -hmm. as you move forward. Thank you. Um, and I apologize, we're running short on time, so I think we'll take one last question, and I'll uh, yield the floor to the gentleman here in the, the second row. Uh, Peter Humphrey, I'm an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. Um, you mentioned uh, the radical changes in interest rates, and I wondered if amongst a substantial fraction of the population that is very conservative, uh, the women, or more likely their husbands, will be completely turned off by the fact that you are working an interest Western model of banking rather than an Islamic banking model, and whether this might be a pretty serious impediment to the participation by many of these conservative women. Thank you. Please. Uh, you're absolutely right. All our research tells us that is true, 
and we, uh, all the microfinance banks are now working towards developing Islamic products for the same market segment. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it's, uh, uh, and you, you, again, you know, it, it's, it's being able to work with them in a way that's, especially in KPK, for example, uh, you, you, the, you, uh, the only you can't the only product which sells is the Islamic finance product. So yes, we, that's something which is being addressed, and I think there's a pivot happening around it, and that's probably going to help grow the market dramatically. Thank you. And I think uh, just to clarify, this uh, whole concept is the largest growth in Pakistan in any case is in this direction. So it's not just women. It's the growth of a different product and a different way of viewing it. And there's a different profit and loss shareholding in it. And there's a, where, so, so the banking industry has not been affected. It's just that you're catering to a different need, whether it's men or women. And uh, there's, there, there are huge opportunities in that which the banks are taking up. Thank you all very much. Um, and I apologize to our uh, colleagues in the audience that uh, Sumira Abbasi was not able to, uh, to meet with us today. Um, but uh, Michael has assured me that we hope that she'll be at the reception and we encourage you all to get to know her there. Um, uh, and on those lines, I would just like to uh, thank our panelists on behalf of the Wilson Center of Indus and our colleagues in the audience for your insights, um, for your preparation, and, and for your encouraging words. Um, and Anlieb, I'm really struck by your, your opening quote about um, misunderstanding and how that causes conflict and how we really need to focus on understanding each other, understanding each other's needs, um, and, and building that kind of respectful environment. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think with that, uh, Michael, I, I'm not sure if you have some instruction or, or Amber about the reception. Uh, the reception will be starting here in a few minutes.